Welcome to episode 39 of The Brainstorm. Lots happening as always. This week, let's chat about Rivian and Starlink. Nick, did you catch the Rivian unveil of the R2? I caught a few images and a few tweets going over it, um, but I'm curious to hear what you have to say on it because this is the space you study the closest. All right, so first let's just set, set stage high level. Um, it looks like their existing car, but smaller. It's a SUV, the R2, starting at $45,000, roughly 300 miles of range, probably a little more on the higher end, maybe a little less on some of the lower end trims. Um, coming out in the first half of 2026, all of the acceleration you'd expect from an EV um, that, that kind of captures it. Maybe we'll flash an image of it. I think it's a pretty good looking car. Um, everyone I know, and this is the way that I broke it down, Nick, in my mind was everyone I know who drives a Rivian loves the car. I think the new car, the R2 looks great. Um, the question I think isn't, is this a cool car? Um, will people like it? It's, always been can Rivian lower its manufacturing costs and start making vehicles profitably. Uh, and you know, they have yet to do that for their premium vehicles. Now they're talking about a lower cost vehicle and trying to do that at a much greater scale. The other, I think important piece here to point out is, is this, you know, I tweeted saying this is a model Y competitor coming out six years after the model Y, which is true in some sense and not true in the other. It's true in that it's the performance and price point are the model Y, right? So it's the fact that Tesla has this out from 2020 and theirs is going to come out in 2026 is a testament, I think, to the advantage and how far ahead Tesla is of the others. But I don't think it's fair to say, and I think people pointed this out, right? It's not really a model Y competitor. It's a gas car competitor. Right, it's a compelling car. It should take share from other gas manufacturers. You've had traditional automakers who've pushed back their EV plans or who haven't necessarily put out, you know, these middle of the cost spectrum vehicles. So I think they will be in there with more of the traditional automakers competing for share as well. And you also have to think in two years from now what other vehicles have come out on the EV side of things. Well, let's focus on this production timeline. You said 26. What are your thoughts about, you know, a 2-year wait time and what does that say about their manufacturing chops compared to Tesla? I mean, Tesla has done launches where, you know, they also have a few years of of wait time, but what do you think about that in when you when you think of Rivian? you're talking about a company that may potentially need to come to market to raise funds because they aren't profitable. So how do you, you know, weight their production timeline in kind of the longer story here? Yeah, I think what you said is right. It would not surprise me or others, I think at ARC to see them come to market on the same day of this announcement. They also announced that they're pausing construction on their, Um, Georgia plant. So it's a $5 billion plant. They say this is going to save them, you know, over $2 billion in capital expenses for now, um, which they're going to likely use to roll out production of the R2. And I do, you know, this is the brainstorm, Nick. This is, um, I'm actively working on, on this type of (laughs) modeling. We, We had done this type of model for Tesla in the early days and saying, you know, what are their current costs? And you can actually see, do like a mini rights law curve for the company and say, okay, this is their cost now. Look at a quarter, you know, a year later as well and say, okay, this is how many vehicles they've made. This is the cost improvement and kind of map out where you think it's going. So literally after this, that's what I'm doing with the rest of the day. Going to see see what it suggests for Rivian, and if we think that they can, 
you know, successfully reduce these costs. I think, you know, the two years, I, the framing I give is it puts them with the traditional automakers, except for Rivian's all in on EV. So they don't have that huge, you know, anchor of a gas business that kind of leads to that innovator, innovators dilemma. Um, Any but, improvements on battery efficiency in this announcement? Did you look through that aspect of the launch? Yes. Yeah, so and not enough details out for that. Um, they did give, you know, some hints there. I think the interesting thing, 2026, two years away, already we're in 2024. You have people reporting battery prices of 54, I think, dollars per kilowatt hour, which is, you know, quite low. We expect those to continue to come down. All of this being said, right, I think the most exciting vehicles in the next two years are not going to be $45,000 vehicles. I think they're going to be $25,000 vehicles and lower. And I think we see that, you know, in markets where EVs are above average penetration are areas where they're low cost and they're less expensive than gas power alternatives. And I think the reality is if you are at the cutting edge right now, you should be able to do that and make compelling EVs that are, you know, beyond sticker price parity. Mm -hmm. And one last question. One, are you committed to tweeting out these findings uh, before this episode goes live so people can go to your Twitter and find I, out wh what you have modeled for Rivian? I, I can't. I, I can't want it committed on, on the show. You know, who knows how long? No, no. I hope I hope to finish this over the next day or two. Um, so I it say should that. be out. So it should be out. Commit. Who, who knows? Who knows? Okay. Guys, when it's when, when it when it's out, uh, maybe maybe if it's done by next week, we can talk about a follow up on next week's brainstorm. Got it. All right. Um, then just my last question in terms of Rivian's approach here. Um, you know, one thing I've always found fascinating in hearing you and Tasha talk about Tesla and Elon, and I always I think it's a quote by him, which is you know the the uh, the product is actually the factory. Um, do you think Rivian has understood that yet, or is there something you know going on when that there's more to the story here than you know just producing a, a good looking car, which I think they have. I would agree with you. Not that it matters, but it's you know there is a larger story here, and you know producing vehicles at scale is extremely hard. That's why there aren't mm -hmm. a lot of successful car companies. And I'm just wondering, you know, from your opinion, do you, do you think they have, un, do you think they understand this? Are they one of the companies you look at and say, you know, they'll, they'll get there given, you know, their approach? Yeah, I think understanding it and executing it are different things. I think they're, they've woken up to it, right? They've spent a huge amount of money and I would even take a step further back. And this is kind of the big misunderstanding of people following Tesla in the early days. I think for a long time, there was this narrative, Tesla did it, so it will be easier for others to do it as well. Whereas I actually think the opposite is true. And it's because Tesla did it, it's now actually harder for others to do. And, you know, Tesla has low costs in its DNA, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they've, they've said they were close to bankruptcy on occasion and that really drove lean manufacturing. Um, Rivian on the other hand came through the private side with lots of cash. And so they were not as conservative. And I think we see that with the kind of cost basis for their current products. And that's, you know, that is hard to reverse. It's definitely a wake up call when you go public and then people start seeing it and, you know, you start, you can't, you can't spend $6 billion uh, on a quarterly basis and, and make it there. Um, and so, right. Everyone said Tesla does this and it's easier to follow. Whereas in fact, what's happened is Tesla's done it and they've reached scale and now they're driving down costs. 
So you don't have this ability to come in at the high end and offer these products because mm-hmm. Tesla's there lo- offering lower cost, better performance products, which makes it very hard to compete. Um, and my last, last question for you, Sam, Rivian has a partnership with Amazon. That's mm-hmm. half statement, half question. I want to confirm that with you. Do you yeah. think they will have, and hopefully compliance lets us keep this in, but do you think they would have trouble coming to market and finding funding? Because it does feel like there is a bit of a success story here from at least a consumer standpoint. I feel like people get very excited about the Rivian launches. So my guess is you know, there are some very large companies out there uh, notably Amazon, maybe Apple, given their news that they're stepping out of the car business that mm-hmm. would consider, you know, a heavy investment in Rivian. Do you think that's likely, or do you think this is like, I guess my question is, could you see this getting gobbled up by one of the mega tech companies wanting to compete in the car space? Yeah. I don't know if necessarily a mega tech company, I think, Maybe there is even other companies that might want them. Um, you know, who knows? I don't want to speak to future. Uh, right, right, right. Right. Got to be complying here. It's like, I do think the market is open if they can demonstrate these cost reductions. Um, to, to your point, right? It's like they make vehicles that people like. Mm-hmm. And that's step one. So the, the, the next key step is making products that, consumers like that you can make profitably. Yeah. Um, okay. That was yeah, a good, like, very compliant what, answer by you. What, what they're doing, what they're doing with Amazon, right. And we've only been talking about the consumer vehicles, but it's like, I see their vans on the street all the time. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, that business likely continues. And uh, I think that will, I'll need to model that as a different cost decline than right. kind of their, consumer, more Patagonia premium products. Yeah. Okay. Very compliant answer by you, Sam. Thanks. I think compliance will be happy. Uh, On to the next topic, Starlink. Can you tell us what's happening? Another potential success story in the making? Yeah. Well, so this is going to come out. Who knows when this episode comes out, but one Starship test flight potentially this week on the 14th. Very exciting. Uh, They also just released news that they have 2.6 million customers. And so, you know, that's continuing their trend of growth. It's impressive. I think it'll continue on that trajectory. It'll be interesting to see if it can inflect upwards with Starship or potential increased capacity, different offerings. Um, And then the other piece of news was, you know, they continue to test the direct to device capabilities. And so they put out a letter saying that, you know, they've done this. They were actually able to send text messages from phones, uh, even indoors in certain locations. Um, and I think this is something that people under appreciate, which is, you know, in our big ideas, we have a chart where we show the number of satellite subscribers as a percent of cellular subscribers. And it's been stalled out, I think, at like 0.04%. So extremely low. When SpaceX launches with T-Mobile, that you know jumps up probably to 1% of all cellular subscribers. But I think the reality is that in the next 5 to 10 years, it could just become commonplace for all cellular subscribers to have this direct to device capability and you know what does it actually cost you you probably don't even notice it it's probably embedded in your bill and it's just everyone has this SOS capability um, but since it's it's a low monthly cost but if everyone has it then that's a lot of subscribers and so that could be you know i think the opportunity size we said there was a $48 billion annual addressable market. And we're not saying that this is all going to Starlink. Um, There's other people working on this. You have Iridium who's trying their own solution, which would probably have some different use cases there. You have Viasat and a coalition of others working on this. You've got some startups like AST Space Mobile 
working on direct to device. Uh, obviously, SpaceX is moving extremely quickly as they often do, but I will not be surprised if every single cellular customer has some type of direct to device capability in the next decade. And App- Apple has this capability yeah. in yeah, some yeah, of the left newer them, generation. Left out another yeah, one of those, yeah. the, the, the obvious. And yeah, that Apple one, I was just start. looking at the price. It's free for two years after the purchase, and then um, there is a fee. But I think to your point, you probably have some bundling aspect of that cost, and you probably won't, from a consumer standpoint, know exactly what you're paying, mm-hmm. um, which is interesting. And I've, I've said this before, and I think it's still true. Everyone says, wow, the world is so connected, right? I can't get off work. I have my cell phone, right? The change from that era pre-cell phone to now post-cell phone. And then I don't think people appreciate that the connectivity everywhere in the world all the time is going to be another step, right? Like you're, you're never off grid anywhere. Mm-hmm. And there's also an enterprise business here as well, right? There's commercial use for, I think it's, you know, the shipping industry. I believe they have different SKUs for that for Starlink yeah. and yeah, yeah. some Air, other industries. Airlines as well. Um, defense, probably going to be a big one. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing, I think we've discussed it before, but, uh, Obviously, there's regulations and agreements with countries saying you can operate here, you can't operate here. I think we will increasingly see people smuggling antennas to various areas um, and being able to have free information flow could change the world in interesting ways as well. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. All right. Yeah. I think that's our that's our show, Sam. Nick, nothing Two-topic exciting happening. N- nothing happening exciting in your your neck of the woods. There always is. There always is. <laughs> but I think you know we got to change up some of the topics from time to time. We've gone heavy AI for the last couple weeks, aka the entirety of the show. Um, so it's good to get a change of pace. Next week, maybe we get some genome on. Um, Sounds good. And, and keep we'll going. We'll see everyone next week. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Bye.